I need some traction. Hey everyone, Lloyd Lobo here, co-founder at Boast AI and Traction. Today's Traction webinar is brought to you by Boast AI and Launch Academy. I am tuning in from Austin, Texas, and our wonderful speaker here, Mariana, where are you tuning in from? I'm calling in from the Bay Area, uh, just south of San Francisco. Awesome. Exciting topic today. You know, um, TechCrunch and the VC world has perpetuated this theme of triple, triple, double, double, double exponential growth, but that's hard. Few startups experience exponential growth. The reality is most businesses grow at different rates and much of that growth is nonlinear, but most VCs require a quick return on their investments and operate on a three to five year funding cycle, which isn't always viable. And Mariana here with Future Ventures, a leading deep tech venture capital firm, operates on a 15-year fund cycle, and she supports her portfolio companies from early stages and provides guidance and funding throughout their journey. Mariana, welcome to Traction. You've had an impressive career as an investor. Give us your backstory. How did you get to where you are today? Uh, thanks so much, Lloyd. It's such a delight to join you today and, and have this conversation. Uh, my a backstory, like most people who end up in venture capital, is um, somewhat nonlinear. I, I didn't, for the vast majority of my life and career, I had no concept of what venture capital was. Um, I was originally born in Ukraine, I was an immigrant kid growing up, uh, and both of my parents are engineers by training, and so that that was the direction that I went in. I I thought that you know, one of the highest forms of being in the world was was building, um, building important things for others to use. And um, for me, I, I figured I'd either end up as an engineer or as a doctor. Uh, and I failed uh, pretty spectacularly on both counts. And now I'm an investor. Um, but I, I did have the good fortune of receiving a um, really spectacular education at Carnegie Mellon in material science and biomedical engineering. And uh, co-founded a company coming out of that and then kind of found my way into consulting as is wont to happen to people who aren't entirely sure what they want to do next, uh, but are trying to figure out how to get a in business education without having to pay for an MBA. So that was more or less how I found myself into consulting at a great group called Lux Research. And um, from there wound my way into Airbus and then it eventually into, into venture capital, uh, because essentially what I realized is that there's so much brilliant, disruptive entrepreneurial spirit that's really shifting the course of humanity. Uh, and large corporations are not the right structures for understanding how to harness that power. And I was so curious about that kind of transitional change in the in the world and you know who has the the means and the gall and the risk profile to to understand how fundamental shifts can happen. And that's kind of how I first learned about venture capital and, and found my way into it. Awesome. And you've invested in a lot of future tech companies, right? Robotics, quantum computing, blockchain, aerospace, the future of food. What is future tech? Define that for us. Um, so future tech is essentially a, a sufficiently amorphous term that it, it doesn't really mean anything, which is great because it is, as a the counter to the to that is that it, it can also mean everything. It's essentially any and, and and different people have different framing for this. Some people call it deep tech, future tech. Uh, I have a lot of people who who joke and say that you know our fund does real technology investment and. It, it's hard to say, okay, well, what, is that, what does that actually mean? And I think broadly what it means is that, that bucket of terms of technologies that are coming that aren't mature and available and readily understood by the majority of us today, but will fundamentally shift how we move forward. And as each technology matures and becomes part of our daily lived experience, we essentially stop seeing it as technology, right? I mean, we we still, I think most of us don't look at our cell phones as these like profound technological devices anymore. It's just, you, you immediately, that, that's the, the joy and the challenge of, 
of working in technology is that uh, essentially you take it for granted al almost immediately, the moment it, it basically starts working. And so an example of this is um, like, let's look at the, the space of robotics. Well, the vast majority of robotics that we think about and we call robotics are essentially things that don't work today but that have deep promise for enabling a better future for us. So for example, robots in agriculture, enabling more efficient weeding, uh, relieving some of the pressure on the workforce, uh, creating um, healthier, more sustainable food that you know, doesn't rip out our, our soil nutrients. But those robots are still coming. So what is an example of a robot that we no longer see as a robot? Well, a dishwasher is a robot, effectively. It's just really, really good at its job, so we don't perceive it as a robot anymore. And so that's the space that we play in, is trying to take that translational space of technologies that are just around the corner that will be hugely impactful and efficacious in our lives and bringing them, hopefully, into that stage of maturity where we stop seeing them as technologies. Fantastic. And what is the most exciting technology or future tech that's on your mind right now? I, I think the, the most exciting to me is, is the one that is most kind of existentially necessary, which is a couple of years ago, you know, five, six years ago, uh, when I was really kind of more in the in the stage of getting started in venture capital and just a couple of years into my career in it, nobody talked about climate technologies. Everybody talked about, yes, the climate crisis is real and it's coming, um, but essentially anything that had to do with sustainability, uh, with regeneration, with kind of clean tech was broadly labeled as this is a sure way to lose money. Yes, it's necessary. We will leave it to the hands of nonprofits uh, and government agencies. And what's so inspired to me now is that we've broadly relabeled the set of technologies as climate tech. Uh, not a lot of things have changed, but a fundamental thing that's changed is the, the level of care, uh, deep mission and desire and just quality of talent that's flowing into the space. I mean, there are more startups in this, in, in, in and around companies working on every aspect of ways to address the climate crisis from, uh, you know, from Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, food, shelter, uh, to helping industrial chemical industries, you know, make their, make their chemical processes, less extractive and painful. And so just spanning the whole gamut, we're, we're seeing such an influx of motivated, talented, interesting ideas and the capital to match it. I would say that's the biggest shift that I've seen in the last couple of years is a sector that nobody would touch with a 10 foot pole or God forbid you said you were interested in it uh, to now it's a, it, we get to call it a central investment thesis. So let's dive into your investment thesis then. What kind of an entrepreneur, what kind of tech, how early, what's the journey? Tell us some more, like how can, uh, what excites you to write that first check? Yeah, so for a little bit of framing context, Future Ventures is myself and my brilliant co-founder, Steve Jurbitson, um, have the deep pleasure of working with. And the two of us started the fund under the vision of what would it look like to run a fund that was unlike any of the other funds that we had worked for previously. So we thought on a couple of axes, which is one, we think small teams make faster decisions. So on the investment side, it's just Steve and myself. And so we're very efficient in our decision making. Um, we've raised two $200 million funds to date, which allows us to be nimble um, in that, you know, one to $10 million checks are kind of our idealized check size. And so that, that then lends itself to where we're most comfortable in the seed and series A stage. Uh, and we like to move with conviction, which is to say that we're not reliant on anyone else's decision process. So if we write a term sheet, it's not contingent on someone else investing, um, 
it might be contingent on the co- company raising a, a sum of capital that we've worked with the entrepreneur to determine is kind of like the necessary minimum. But uh, we we basically try try our best to make independent decisions. And what we really look at is that that translational layer that I talked about. You know, we we don't necessarily want to invest in first principles, unproven chemistry, biology, or physics in the sense that it's really hard to time fundamental scientific breakthrough innovation, right? So if if a if a baseline breakthrough is required in a field of study for your business to make sense, then we say you should probably go figure that out in the lab and you may not want to take on venture dollars to do that um, because no points awarded for raising a bunch of capital, figuring out the science doesn't work and then and then being left holding the bag. Um, that said, we, we do take on some of those, uh, but I, I would say fewer and further between. We, we look more at that translational layer where the science is largely proven, important experiments still need to be run, but it really comes down to a question of engineering. And so we have we have an investment, for example, in nuclear fusion, which I think makes most people scratch their heads when we say we're not investing in uh, novel breakthrough science. And so, well, how did you guys come to invest in a fusion company? And the answer is that um, the Commonwealth Fusion was able to prove in peer reviewed studies to the plasma physics community that if they could build a magnet of this strength, that they actually were then able to go and and turn on the world's most powerful electromagnet, then if you could build that magnet, then it would fall out that you could build a particular type of fusion plant called the tokamak with the right economics uh, and and total energy creation and and cost for that and for that electricity that would fundamentally shift uh, the the entire um, focus of of the nuclear industry. And so that, I think that that's a perfect example of we took a risk. We invested in the company before the magnet existed, but we believed in the company's capacity to build that magnet because that was an engineering question, not a physics question. Definitely. Now, we talk about this three to five year cycle, triple, triple, double, double, double versus 15 year fund cycle, which future is on. It's you know, I feel like uh, I'm a founder as well. Founders want to chase money to fund their companies. And sometimes even though you're not aligned with investor incentives, you bite the bullet and take it. And that leads to problems later on. Tell us more about this three to five year cycle versus 15 year cycle and what led you down that path? I mean, essentially, the the three to five year cycle works for a particular kind of company, right? It's it works very well for enterprise software businesses where the breakthroughs there. And it's not to say those companies aren't technically challenging, but essentially, writing writing good code while expensive because engineers are expensive is a is a lower overhead cost. And there's a real beauty in software development in that you can release piecemeal feature sets and ensure that there's customer traction and uptake. And so there, there's also, there's good reason that investors request a particular type of revenue growth in those companies, because the simple reality is it's, it's also level setting. Are you building something customers want? We really support that. We have a couple investments that, uh, you know, will take on a, a similar trajectory in terms of how they come to market. Um, Occam is a company, for example, in our portfolio that is focused on uh, machine-to-machine communication and ensuring that any two devices can communicate and identify one another in a fully trustless framework. This This is like a this is going to be a necessary piece of technology moving forward. And so that's a company where we expect a particular form of like, okay, you know, you you need to, to make sure that as you build out this, this product suite that customers are excited to work with it. The flip side is that Occam, for example, needed to basically rewrite a lot of fundamentals of um, how, how to create a cryptographically secure system 
that would allow this kind of communication in a just-in-time fashion across uh, different, different data structures. And we recognize that that's a really hard thing to build in you know, six months so that you can release your first product suite. And so essentially what we do is we try to take on less end market risk in our investments, uh, but tolerate in as a counter, which is that it's going to take longer for you to build the technology, but we have more certainty that once it exists, the customer suite is there. Um, an example of this is we we recently invested in a male non-hormonal contraception company, uh, right? So the pill for men. Now, the pill for men is just a really interesting concept. It's not something that we have market analysis of, about because it doesn't exist. And as a drug, it's not approved yet. It's just going into clinical trial. And so what we think about it is the early scientific data suggested to us that it was both safe and efficacious. That's the point at which we're willing to take the, the risk of the investment. And then we'll make the transition um, to understanding, you know, they first have to prove that it's actually safe and efficacious in humans. Uh, and from there, we, we essentially just have a belief about the world that men should have just as much power and say and control over their decided forms of contraception. Uh, and we think that that will be societally beneficial for all peoples. And so like, right. So the, the flip side there is rather than saying you have to make this many dollars of return in four years, we say, you just need to make sure that this technology is safe and efficacious. And we believe that this is a direction the world will turn. Um, it's, it, it's frightening. It, it requires you to stand on the press up and, and try to be, um, have a prognostication about the direction the world might turn. Now let's shift to company building, building startups. How should startups think about building companies in this deep tech, future tech world as they go from idea to product market fit to unicorn, right? Let's dive into what are the key ingredients to building a successful startup? You know, I think I, I think this is one of those questions where depending on who the person is who's building it, there are probably different answers because they're like each entrepreneur has their own unique set of gifts. And then the thing that will make them successful is ensuring that the gifts they don't have are what their team and their investors and whoever's around them in support and in community is able to bring to the table. So I would say the, the major pieces are the individuals. Are they brilliant, motivated, have deep, unique expertise in the sector that they're in um, and really mission-driven? Because at the end of the day, as you well know, as you know better than most, startups are really hard. They're so taxing. And if you're not deeply motivated by the mission of bringing this thing into being, then at some point you're going to want to rip your hair out and bang your head into a wall because why are you doing this? You know, it's taking away your time and your health and causing anxiety. And so we, we see that, um, a trend that really alleviates the risk of kind of founder burnout or team burnout or, or team uh, issues is just everyone being really aligned on what they're building and why. Uh, the second, from our perspective, is good fundamentals. You know, if you're if you're if you're starting with bad assumptions or bad science, you, you kind of can't walk your way out of that hole. Um, a, a brilliant team could potentially pivot into something that is, uh, you know, if, if one direction doesn't work, then, then have, you know, maintaining some level of optionality. Um, but I, I think what we see is it, as, as a, as a, as a last point is, uh, a deep market understanding of the sector you're entering in the sense of, do you know who the customers are? And then specifically, do you know how to get in touch with them? Because, it's one thing to look at an industry like construction and say, wow, it's broken, it's inefficient, trillions of dollars are lost every year. Uh, and it's a different thing 
to actually be able to say, here are the major players, here are the five top construction companies in the world, and here are the individuals in those companies who actually can make buy decisions on software contracts. And so, for example, we see this in one of our companies, Alice Technologies, that the CEO came from a background in construction and really understood the framing of the construction industry. And so that makes a big difference than when someone potentially in a, in a school program writes up a thesis and goes, I think I want to sell this kind of thing to this industry. Um, they might eventually get there, but it's so much faster if you actually understand who the key players are, who is able to make a buy decision. You know, so really understanding who your customer is and how to get in front of them. Definitely. And what do you see in this stage, though? Like, because I feel like startups are built in stages, right? And, uh, you know, you have an idea, you validate it, uh, then you get people to keep coming back, get to product market fit, and then, then you get to scale. Um, what have you seen as key things people stay on top of at each of these phases when building from an idea to scale? I think the first key is hiring a good team. Uh, we've, we've seen, um, and, and there's a real, there, there's a, there's a deep philosophical question here, which is essentially, do you take the time to hire the team you absolutely you know, the best possible team you can have, or do you just, you know, hire good enough? And, and I think being very um, thoughtful about which roles you're hiring the best possible candidates for and which roles you're saying, we, you know, we, we need bodies in the room um, is not a question of, you know, can, can those bodies in the room be efficacious, but it's essentially how much do you hire people who hit the ground running and know what they're doing versus people you need to train and educate. Uh, and so I think the first thing is, is just founder, founders need to be really, really thoughtful of who they hire at the earliest stages and what kind of roles those people um, will, will be filling. Uh, it, it makes such a difference early on in the traction of a life of a company. Uh, the, the next part that's probably the most important is understanding what do your customers want? And this is true from you know, biotech to neural implants, to nuclear fusion, to, to software companies is actually figuring out what, what is the deliverable that you can actually execute on in the time and capital that you have uh, and being really honest about that, just just in actually ensuring that you're tracking uh, your budget and spend, because so often what we see is that companies set um, aggressive and potentially optimistic goals, and then uh, some number of months later, uh, you know, it turns out it it took more capital and time than they had, uh, and now they have to go fundraise with a third of the data that they were expecting to have, and that that's a tough position to be in. Definitely. That's definitely a tough position to be in. And, you know, when fundraising, a lot of founders exaggerate the growth goals. And then when you're not aligned, investors are like, grow, grow, grow. But really, you need to get to product market fit or validate. And that just creates all kinds of tension. So you talk about evaluating in multi-year intervals to project growth. Tell us more about that. Dive into that. Yeah, I, look, at the end of the day, when you when you get a pitch deck as a seed or a series A investor and uh, someone, you know, a, whether it's the CEO or um, CFO or interim business manager in the company, they 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 do these beautiful uh, pro formas explaining the mechanics and the exact spend down to the cent of the company for the next five years. And. To be perfectly honest, you can never take those performance seriously. They're essentially baseless um, in the sense that they don't, they're not based on real data because the company hasn't been operating and you just have a best assumption of what your true costs are, what your vendor costs are, what your sales costs are. And so what we try to do is look at those models from the perspective of one is the is the reasoning sound and rational, right? Can I follow those models are important, not because the actual numbers are that important, but because the the framework, the style of thinking, the evident cognitive biases that show up in that 
is is the important part. Um, it's also important to track it over time, right? So to your point, uh, you get pitched one thing uh, and then six months later after the investment in the first board meeting, you realize, okay, you know, all timelines have slipped, but that's fine as long as, you know, the reasoning of how we've tracked them hasn't shifted. And the, the third piece, and this is really the piece about why I think in, investors who have operated in in um, adjacent sectors of interest to the thing you're building in are useful is that they can help level set for you, right? Um, one of one of our capacities as investors is we'll see way more iterations than a single entrepreneur will of what a sales cycle is like in an industry. And so we can be honest and say, you think you're going to get this contract in three months, but we've never seen one actually signed in less than nine. Uh, and so let's level set. And so I think a lot of it too is in, in the longer arc, just looking very closely at the assumptions and making sure that they're very sound assumptions. Uh, because when you're, when you're not in a, two-year frame rate, you, you have to spend a lot more time thinking about the fundamental assumptions in, in the underlying. Uh, we also, we, we still push for outcomes um, on those shorter time frames. It's not to say that we we invest and then say, you know, call us in seven years when this company is functional. We, we, we participate alongside the entrepreneur saying, okay, at every moment, what is the best possible decision for this company? Definitely. Now the markets have twisted for the worse, right? We went from unicorns being minted every day, maybe a unicorn and a half being minted every day and sky high valuations to a lot of uncertainty in the markets, interest rates up, stocks are taking a beating, valuations are down, layoffs galore. What advice are you sharing with your companies right now? Yeah, so one, don't panic. Uh, anxiety and fear and concern, um, it not only reflect in, you know, the entrepreneur and their sleep quality. And if they start losing sleep, they'll start losing cognitive function too. It also reflects, you, you can't hide that from your team. So if you're feeling profoundly stressed about the overall market, uh, I would say, you know, a pause for for every entrepreneur is, is it's important to take a pause and say, how does this actually affect you? What what are what is the pain point in the near term? Is the first pain point that you're not going to raise a subsequent round of capital? Okay, well that 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 could be an existential question, but perhaps what you need to do is figure out how to extend runway, right? So figure out all of the ways that you can lower burn, figure out which in which means you could extend capital, you know, consider flat rounds. These aren't that threatening in the long arc of a company, they're just realities that you have to engage with. The second aspect is you know, potentially this is a good time to reprice uh, if you had a, to have novel 409A valuations. People are really afraid of this because they think that having repriced is going to be uh, somehow morally damaging for the company. It's it's exactly the opposite. Uh, repricing at a, at a moment like this is an opportunity for employees to, to it's, it's such a benefit to them in terms of their options packages. Um, and, and I think entrepreneurs should take advantage of that. Um, and the last piece is, you know, just prepare to weather the storm. There are all sorts of storms that happen in startup land. And the, the real question with markets crashing is that people are, people are willing to take uh, more time on investment decisions. So expect your fundraising to be slower. Uh, and they're, they're not as willing to pay up on hyped prices, right? So the faster the investment pace, the fewer people make, um, the, the less time people make to, to make decisions, the more they're willing to pay up. Now we're we're in the counter of that. And so I, I think it's just a question of being mentally prepared for the reality. Certainly. Now, what metrics are boards and investors focusing on right now? What do you advise founders to look at? Well, I think... It's a, it's probably deeply frustrating for 
um, founders because it, essentially no metric is sufficient short of, you know, somehow having billions of dollars in revenue. Like it, 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 there, there's like the sliding scale of risk tolerance that um, investors broadly at any stage have. And in the in in downturn markets, uh, investors are essentially saying, well, I don't have to take on that much risk anymore. Uh, so you you have to you have to prove the world to me. And so I, I don't think there's a, a specific answer for any company other than you, you need to prove unequivocally that somebody wants the thing you're building and they're willing to pay for it. And essentially what you need to show is that they're willing to pay for it such that if you can believe that there are other such somebodies out there, right? So that your customer is indicative of other customers and that they're willing to pay an actual cap amount of capital for you for whatever you're building. And then those two things together are like, those are unequivocal proof points. Everything short of that, you you basically just need to tell a really compelling story, uh, which is a good practice and every entrepreneur should know how to do. But the simple reality is you're going to get a lot of people saying, cool, this is interesting. Call me when you have a partnership or business development deal or some type of data you don't currently have. And that's that's just the world we're in. So large TAM, prove that you can get customers, some repeatable, scalable way to get customers. And then your customers are not leaving you, they're staying, or maybe they're spending more. I think, yeah. And, you know, again, like, in our companies, for example, I think there's a little bit less of the question of like, are your customers leave? Like our companies have less of a question of are your comp- are, are are the customers going to leave you? Because theoretically, our, our technology companies are so existential to their customers, which is to say that, you know, the product never existed before. So they wouldn't leave you for a competitor because there aren't really any. Uh, and that you make their business so much better that you would be leaving as a customer, you'd be leaving so much capital on the table if you left the partnership. Um, And and so it's a little, so I I think that question of um, long-term, you know, customer stickiness and and turnover is a little bit less of a question for us, Uh, but, but maybe there are broader implication questions. Like if you look at alternative proteins, like eating, meat uh that was grown in you know without in a humane manner without slaughter in a clean facility um d- you know do do people in market downturns perhaps all people just eat less protein because it's expensive right and so that like that kind of thing is is hard to track uh and so i i think we we have tolerance there um but I, I I also believe that if you're creating products that are so fundamental to our continued existence on this planet, that you're not really as much at risk for customer turnover. Certainly. Now, what are the key drivers of valuation? Maybe at C, Series A, um, Series B that you're seeing? A simple reality is that at seed, we're essentially... Um, the company has very little other than a good idea and maybe a handful of people. The primary driver is the the quality. (laughs) However, it's broadly defined by the person looking at it. But essentially, the assurance that an investor can have that the team working on it is exceptionally well qualified to do so. So I'd say the highest valuations at the earliest stages are received by entrepreneurs who have done something successful before, so they're perceived as lower risk, that have deep expertise in a field and are seen as experts in the sector that they're working in, and that they've recruited a team uh, that is equivalently powerful, right? Uh, And so this is a, a question I often get from entrepreneurs of like, how do I recruit people when I don't have capital to pay them? And, uh, or, you know, we're just getting started and I, I can't convince people to take a big enough leap of faith to to leave their comfortable job at, at Google or wherever they're at and come work on this crazy startup. And my answer is go keep looking for an idea until you find one that is so compelling to people that they're actually willing to make that jump. Because short of that, you're probably not working on anything sufficiently interesting. 
Um, so I, the primary driver, to be perfectly honest, is team at the early stage, and then and then idea, uh, and then the after that, I mean the 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 team and idea can can probably pull you through a series A to some extent, um, and after that, it's are you actually executing on the goals as you set them, right? So if you said you were going to bring mRNA therapeutics to market uh, or through some level of clinical trial, did you actually do so on the time frame? right? So it's, it's all like, after that, it's all about is, has your story stayed consistent? And so I think that's a really important question for founders to ask early on, which is tell the optimistic, crazy world-changing story. But if you're way off on what you can achieve in what timeline, that will be seen as a derogatory later on, right? Because if you said, I'm gonna have, uh, you know, if, I, if, you're, if, you, if you say something like, we're going to reforest uh, Panama by uh, 2024 and it's 2020 and then 2024 rolls around and you haven't done that, you, you, you've got explanations to make, right? So I would say uh, that that optimistic storytelling is so necessary, but you also have to execute on it. Certainly. Now, what are the valuation multiples you're seeing out there? Like, I mean, at peak, you know, I saw 20, 40, 100x, especially at the earlier stages, seed and whatnot. Um, what are you seeing right now? Or what is reasonable for entrepreneurs to expect so the level in, set in terms of multiple on revenue multiple on revenue or sort of some benchmark of valuation uh, i mean <laughs> you know it, if it's a multiple on revenue there there's still plenty of like infinite multiples out there, which is to say that there's lots of companies who have received increasingly high valuations um, and continue to do so even in this climate without having any, any revenue. Um, what we see right now, that's, that's it's, it's absolutely happening in the biotech spaces and we're seeing it trickle down in, into all other sectors, which is very, I would say, modest valuation bump. So we would often see maybe a, a two to five X shift around a, a, a valuation um, bump between the A and the B. And now increasingly, you know, if you, if you get a two X that I would say that's deeply successful. Uh, and it, what, what a lot of companies are doing right now is rather than raising their subsequent round, they're raising extension capital at flat rounds or at down rounds, like slight down rounds um, it, or convertible notes with significant discounts just because they, they're, they're feeling sufficiently threatened that they want to expend a little bit of runway uh, and try to weather out hopefully coming, coming into a market that's more uh, more optimistic and, and friendly towards future fundraisers. But I mean, valuations have always been unhinged from reality. Uh, so there, I don't know that that's really sufficiently changed. It's just maybe metered down a little bit. Certainly, certainly. Every, and no one wants to hear that they want to, they have to raise at a down round or lower expectation. But the reality is, at the peak in the last couple of years, maybe last October, it was severely spiked. It was demand and supply plus um, different forms of capital coming into the market inflated that as well, faster turnaround times and the market's just adjusting and whatever valuation you raise at, you have to eventually grow into it, right? As a founder. That's right. And I, and I, I really talked to founders about this, which is, there, there's an obvious deep motivation for themselves, for the morale of the team to raise at the highest possible valuation you could have. But you have to realize that that puts you in a potentially precarious situation. That happened to many companies that raised very expensive series Bs, for example, and maybe didn't take on that much capital. So now you have all these companies out there that have like half billion to multiple billion dollar valuations with single digit millions in revenue. 
And they're going to have to figure out how to weather it forward and justify that valuation in the face of a market that isn't as tolerant towards that going forward. But like that, that risk existed for them when those founders took on that capital. Right. Uh, and so it, it's just one of those questions where you should always be thinking ahead and saying, yeah, I, I, I could raise uh, at a hundred million dollar series A valuation if I wanted to, but how do I justify a multiple on that price in two years or whenever I run out of capital? Certainly. Now, where do you see most startups fail and how to prevent it? Um, I think statistics, I mean, so one of the things that um, I think it was Mark Andreessen uh, said, and I, I don't agree with many things he said, but I thought this was just foundationally true, which is at the end of the day, startups only die because they run out of money. Um, you know, with, with sufficient capital, you can kind of weather any storm, but that's a really inefficient path. And so there, I, I think there's a, a couple of consistent mechanisms, uh, under which, uh, companies struggle, which is one, the, the founder decides they don't actually care that much about this idea. It's more work than it's worth for them or for them as a founding team, and so I would say just people dynamics, like it, people dynamics are a real struggle. Uh, so being really thoughtful about who your co-founders are, who your first hires are, uh, that that's probably the highest risk to the earliest stage of companies. Um, the, the next is uh, working on poor assumptions, whether that be scientific assumptions where the, you know you believe certain things to be true uh, about the world on like a core physics biology level uh, and it just didn't work out. And so just understanding, you know, is there an existential scientific risk to your company in the near term? Uh, best to understand that early because we, you, you see a lot of companies that just say, oh, that, you know, that was a dead branch of reasoning and, and then trying to scramble and, and pivot. Um, and the third is, is a, a poor market understanding. So just not, not a not having a holistic and complete picture of who the buyer or user of what you're building is and what does it take to get in front of them and gain their trust and gain motivation from them to actually engage with you. So for example, it's really hard to sell to doctors. Uh, it's much actually easier to sell to medical systems and hospitals and that in itself is also exceptionally difficult. And so just understanding certain things, like if you're entering a market, like you want to sell to individual physicians, great, but good luck. It's really hard. It's exceptionally hard to get a hold of them. They don't move as a single unit. Uh, they don't make collective decisions. Uh, so if you want to do something in a space like that, how are you going to herd those cats? Certainly. Certainly. Now, as you're talking to your founders, in um, in this downturn, what are you saying? There, where they should be investing and where they should be pulling back right now? Yeah, I think you know, for every one of our portfolio companies, they're they're so diverse. I mean, we have a company that's focused on um, bolstering the immune systems of bees, the insects, um, to. A uh, company like Hum Capital that's that's uh, figuring out how to provide um, a later stage capital at a lower cost uh, to other startups, right? So the the two don't uh, the two types of companies uh, in that in that juxtaposition wouldn't receive the same advice from us. Um, so one one perspective is to say that advice helps no one. Uh, it, you know, it's it, all advice comes from a biased perspective and potentially it comes with good intent, but I think every entrepreneur needs to look honestly at their business and say, realistically, what do I have to do? And what are the nice to haves? Uh, it's a good time to pause a lot of the nice to haves, but that lends itself to, there's the obvious question of, okay, but what if we get everything right? And because we've pushed off this future growth and development in five years, we arrive at a position where 
the next stage of our evolution isn't ready. Like the technology isn't mature. We don't understand because we, you know, we didn't do the subsequent experience experiments or, um, or development to, to, you know, build out the next feature set. And, and that's a real question. And I think the, the question is um, how to, how to strike that balance. It's a bit different for every company. I think one of the fundamental pieces of advice we're giving is if there is capital that is interested in coming into your company right now, take it. Like just it, there's there's no reason to have your back against the wall in the next 12 months if there's, you know, if it's marginally, maybe slightly painfully dilutive to you right now, but the the extra runway that will give you and the peace of mind is so worth it. And so we we're we're broadly telling companies like expect fit all fundraising you take 50% longer at this point and so if capital is interested in coming in just take it and also specifically i would say the other thing is in a volatile market like this close the round as soon as possible i have seen this and this is purely anecdotal but just term sheets getting pulled in the last couple of weeks because the market dynamics are sufficiently changing and you know what what could have been a mutually agreed upon and pretty good price for everyone 4 weeks ago suddenly feels more painful to an investor. So if you get a term sheet as a founder and you're reasonably happy with it, sign it. Just sign it. Like don't this is not the time to be dragging out deals. Do you recommend then uh, you know if a company raised at a good valuation before and now to avoid that potential down round, let's say if you're doing it with internal investors, um, you do like a convertible debt on a non-price round. Is that a possibility? For sure. Um, I think, you know, investor, all investors, including your insiders at this point, um, everybody wants to know what they're getting. So uncapped notes are, I think, going to be less popular in the future. But you could um, probably cap at the at the last round or something. Correct. Right. right? So, so I think, if you run into that, and, and we've, we've done this, for example, where there are certain companies in our portfolio where we're like, look, go get an external term sheet because that's the best sign. But we really understand what's going on here. And, you know, we'll, if, if it doesn't come together, if it doesn't come together on a time frame that makes sense to you, we'll, you know, the, the insiders will rally for support. But there's a price for that. Um, so I, I think that there will be, I mean, this is, this is why companies, this is the benefit of having long-term thinking, you know, institutional investors is that it's in those moments of broader crisis and concern where your insiders should be the ones you're turning to for support and help. Um, and, you know, if, if they abandon you, that's, that's a particularly hard path. And so one of the things that we're thinking about is how do we participate in rounds that are currently happening, but keep hold on to as much reserve as we can to ensure that should it continue to trend in this direction, we can really support our portfolio. Certainly. Now, how long of a runway should people prep for when they're raising right now in this market? I, I think at the end of the day, uh, I mean, it, it varies, right? Like you have crypto companies out there right now that even in the face of like, the crypto market's crashing. They still have like two decades worth of cap. Like they have so much money that they like couldn't spend it if they tried. And I actually think there's a risk to that. Like it, that's nice and good for them, but the the risk to that is that they could go off the rails, right? Like when you're when you're like that, you're not motivated to check in with the market or with anybody else. Like you you can just you can delude yourself into your own perspective of uh, grandeur and, and virtuosity and that, you know, nobody, nobody can tell you what to do because you have so much money that you don't care. Um, so I think trying to grab that decades worth of capital, uh, I mean, I suppose do it if you can, but it, it just doesn't, doesn't seem um, like the, the best possible form. I, I still think that the, it, so what ha what we saw at the at the peak of the market was companies fundraising every like nine months, even though they weren't really running out of cash. I think we'll we'll shift back to is more of a cadence of like an eighteen month cycle, and so I think essentially what you need to plan on is about twenty four months twenty twenty four months of capital at a normal burn rate, maybe thirty six if you squint and cut a lot. 
Uh, and so that, I think that, that should give enough breathing room to most companies to continue a, a normal cadence. Certainly. Now, in your, what percentage of your portfolio companies are raising right now? Um, not that, so we have, we have two, I'm, I'm like looking at our list. We have two companies that are actively fundraising uh, or we're actively fundraising and, or uh, three, so like less than 10% are actively fundraising right now. Um, uh, yeah. So they, they, they had a good amount of capital to carry them through. So, so one question I had here was, how do you get to a point where an injection of funding can significantly boost your growth? How do you, what, what is the holy grail there? So I think that happens in two cases. And in, and in one case, venture capital probably isn't the correct dollar. So one is if you have certainty about like the, the product is complete um, or, or quite complete, right? Like there's not more features that customers are uh, desperately asking for or some piece of it like technologically that doesn't work. So if, if the product is complete and you, you've got a couple like keystone customers, then an infusion of capital can really bolster a sales uh, a sales team and a, and a customer success team. The other is if it's a manufacturing question. So like again, there's a there's a level of like engineering completion, uh, and now you essentially need to finance like the build out of the manufacturing facility or the next twenty robots or whatever, and. In that case, there's actually alternative forms of financing, which we might recommend. So uh, taking on like real asset uh, equity financing or uh, project debt financing. So like there's later stages of mezzanine financing that can uh, understand like, okay, you have a thing that's working and now you need to scale it up. You probably shouldn't raise venture dollars for that. Certainly, yeah. And debt can be a huge, 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 benefit right and it's it's helped us as well we've we've taken significant debt but um you know we have equity as well and it's just good stewardship towards your business if you're exploring all these other opportunities to maintain or lower your your dilution especially if you have good business fundamentals arr growth um, good gross margins high nrr um, it's it only makes sense, and there's a lot of resources right now, like Cap Chase, for example, or Sterling Bank. Um, in instances, you can get debt at three to six percent, which was unheard of a few years ago. So there's a lot of a lot of options there. Uh, definitely, ultimately, though, if you have customers that want what you're building and they're paying you for it and they're sticking around, I think you create a lot of options for yourself beyond just equity, especially in these times where you say, okay, you know what, maybe I don't go to market and dilute myself. I'll take a little bit of uh, debt kind of thing. I, I no. completely agree with you. Like the, the only caveat I'll, I'll say is that the thing to be careful about with debt is that there are no um, adverse, like material adverse change clauses in those contracts, because the problem with debt is while everything is going well, great. But if something changes fundamentally about your company or the markets as the bank perceives it, uh, that's when you most need those deadlines. And a lot of a lot of those deadlines will be written in such a manner that that's when those banks can recall them. And so that's the one thing that we help our companies think about and spend time with when they're reviewing those contracts is that um, you actually have access to the debt when you most need it. But... What, what is that fine line? What is the key thing to look out for there in that no. debt to equity balance? What are some pitfalls? So, um, well, a pitfall is is essentially having material adverse change clauses in the debt contracts, which say that, a, a, and generally it'll be a couple of paragraphs and every bank will say, we cannot give you uh, debt without these uh, caveats in our favor. And and the answer is that's not true. <laughs> like we, We've seen plenty of contracts where they can. There is a certain amount of risk that the bank can and can't take on because of the type of financial institution that it is. Um, but for for example, a, a bank shouldn't be able to independently determine uh, whether or not they still believe in the valuation of your company. Uh, and 
they, and, and they can't, so, so a simple example is that some of them will write down, like, if you have this, you know, fewer than this many dollars in your bank account, you can't draw on the deadline. You're like, no, that's like, that's when you need the deadline, you know, go find a different bank. Um, the, the debt to equity balance, uh, I, I think it, it all, it, it's a sliding scale based on the fundamentals of your business. Uh, if you are uncertain about the fundamentals of your business and who's paying you to build what, don't take on a lot of debt. Uh, because that that's when that's when your equity investors have the tolerance and the time. Um, the more mature and kind of business proof points you have, the more that you can plug your company into a spreadsheet and actually understand its business fundamentals and economics, the more debt will service you. Certainly. What is, what is a good debt to equity ratio in your, in your view? Uh, it varies so much. I, I mean, most of our companies um, have like less than 10% uh, debt, but that's mostly because the banks won't, you know, see it in series A, you're not getting a lot. Uh, so I, I think it's it's very manageable in um, single digit percentages of debt, uh, but then you're not necessarily if the if the interest rates are low, you're not leveraging it a, enough. So um, I, I think I tend to be m- maybe more cautious on the debt to equity ratio, uh, but I, I think you can go quite high on debt as long as you understand your economics. Awesome. Now we're just getting to the close here. As we part, what's one piece of unconventional advice that founders don't utilize enough? I Relaxing. Like I, I think every founder that I meet is in this panic state of doing and being and, uh, you know, running straight up a wall um, it's rare that that is the mindset and headspace in which your most thoughtful and creative ideas are actually born. So just ensuring that you actually take the time for rest and understanding and, and taking yourself out of the ferret, you know, like ferret on methamphetamines cycle of like, ah, everything's blowing up and I have to work on everything all at once and do, 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 do. Um, and put yourself more in a position of stepping back, looking abstraction, like looking longer term. And I think that 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 can only come from a place of um, calm and centered and a restful mindset. And I think it's really important that founders, even at the earliest stages, take some time to work on that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, self-care is never selfish, right? It's the only way you can create value for your company. If you burn out, the biggest outcomes seem to be founder-led from Shopify to Airbnb. And if you burn out, you're going to destroy your company eventually. And uh, and also the other thing is like not boiling the ocean and being worried about a hundred things. What's the highest leverage thing you can do in this phase, right? Like I see often, if, um, you know, I angel invest a bit and I see how often founders, they're trying to validate and get their first five, 10 paying customers. And they're worried about the website and setting up HubSpot and all this digital marketing. And I'm like, no, just get these, validate with these five, 10 people. You can worry about the website maybe once you have them kind of thing, right? Um, awesome. This has been fantastic. Where can we find you? Where are you active on social? What if somebody wants to pitch you? Uh, so we, we have a pretty active Facebook page uh, that's Future Ventures. Um, anybody's welcome to email me. I'm just Mariana at future.ventures. Uh, and my co-founder, Steve, is everywhere on the internet. So go follow his Twitter. That's uh, Future Jurvitson. Awesome. And uh, last question here. What's the number one book you recommend to founders? Or maybe you don't. <laughs> uh, there... There are a lot of books I recommend. Um, I think it depends on the founder, but uh, the one that's coming up for me right now is uh, it's Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Um, Just a a beautiful reflection on uh, human suffering and agency and awareness. And I think it's, it's a, it's a profoundly impactful book in my life. And I think it's, it's a good level setting. This, uh, I'm going to drop the link here, right here. Awesome. 
Thank you so much, Mariana. It was a great pleasure. I learned a ton. Great advice here. Wishing you success and lots of decacorns in your future tech portfolio. Have a Thank nice you, weekend. Bye. I need some traction.